Assalamualaikum and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to day five, the final day of Digital Disruptors Week at the Malaysia Tech Month 2021. We're coming to you live, virtually, Malaysia, the heart of digital ASEAN. My name is Hasro and I'll be your host for the day. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome you this fine Friday morning, 27th August, 2021. I'd like to thank everyone here taking time off to join us on this morning with this virtual platform enabling us to connect in these unpredictable times. For those just tuning in, let's bring you up to speed. The Malaysia Tech Month, also known as MTM 2021, was launched by the Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC, throughout the month of August as a virtual month-long curation of electrifying digital and technology keynotes, workshops, discussion panels, and a business matching sessions. It will feature distinguished groups of local and international industry speakers and investors to share their expert thoughts and experiences in the 4IR digital economy. MTM 2021 will see exciting programs that will allow the spotlight to be shown upon digital ecosystem leaders and creators, leading edge companies as well as talents, enabling all stakeholders to discover new perspectives on domestic and global trends in artificial intelligence, drone tech, data analytics, fintech, Islamic fintech, e-commerce, ag tech, creative games and animation, and not forgetting the digital workforce. Before we move on, allow me to convey some housekeeping guidelines. Number one, any questions to our speakers, you can submit them via the Q&A comment box below. Number two, meeting and chat room attendees are, but, uh, chat rooms are available for attendees for your networking convenience. And number three, please complete the survey for each session for us to continuously serve you better. Number four, last but not least, should you require technical assistance, please chat with the admin on this virtual platform. Well, thank you everyone. Now we move on for the first session of the day entitled Ramping Up Malaysia's Tech Ecosystem in the ASEAN Startup Arena. Presenting in this 45-minute session is J.M. Gautier, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Startup Genome. Jeff is the world's leading voice in innovation ecosystem development, having advised and learned from more than 100 governments and private public partnerships across 40 countries. He will be joined by Gopi Ganeshalingam, Vice President, Tech Ecosystems and Globalization, Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, as they discuss on Malaysia's tech ecosystem in ASEAN's startup space. For now, both of them, including me, all the men in blue. Over to you, JF and Gopi. Thank you very much and a good morning to yeah. everyone. We are on our final day of the Disruptor Week. And um, thank you for the uh, introduction, Hasrul, to into Startup Genome and JF. So welcome aboard, uh, JF, and good evening to you. It's Thursday evening in Silicon Valley. So good evening and thank you for making it to MTM 2021. Thank you, Gopi. It's great to be here again. Yeah, time flies. We, 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 I mean, we spoke in November 2020, uh, and I just want to put some things in perspective, uh, Jeff. We spoke uh, at the MTM, and you were very daring. You mentioned a couple of things that were going to happen to our ecosystem here. One of the things that you mentioned and uh, is that you, uh, Startup Genome believes that Grab is a Malaysian unicorn. And uh, that went on headline news uh, the very next day. And you said that because it was born out of Kuala Lumpur, uh, if Kuala Lumpur didn't have an ecosystem, there would be no grab. So that is one particular, one huge statement that you made. But you made some predictions, right? You made predictions that this year in 2021, you believe that the KL ecosystem would draw a lot of funding. A lot of investors would come in. Uh, and that's partially true because we've seen a lot of money coming through. Uh, we've seen a Series C taking place. We've seen a Series D taking place. We also predicted there would, that there would be there could be a unicorn in 2021. And guess what? Kasem was announced as uh, Malaysia's first, uh, they said first tech unicorn. Um, so what does your principle tell us for 2021, 2022, Jeff? <laughs> well, you know, I said I made those pre predictions because based on data and based on real deep research of, of emerging ecosystems and, and Malaysia in particular. And you had, you know, I've, I've been working with Malaysia for 
I don't know, since we started really advising governments in 2015. And your ecosystem had created such, had gone through such a rapid growth, rapid development, one of the fastest growing ecosystem we had seen. It was defying our data science. <laughs> <laughs> and at that size, when we saw you're getting to 1,200, 1,300 startups, right? you have a massive ecosystem uh, that is reveling other globalization phase ecosystem and where the accumulation of knowledge among the entrepreneurs, the talent, the investors called to it, makes it ripe for gr producing great success. But you had grown so fast that most of the startups were really young. Uh, but at one point, they age and they start really being world leaders and regional leaders. And that's what we're saying. And I'm so happy to see that. And, and you're saying, you know, there's been a growth in, in funding and, and uh, other uh, exits and, you know, across the board. And it's not just a growth, it's an explosion. Um, and so I'll, I'll be happy to show you some of the data from the, the world versus Malaysia. And it's quite fantastic. But, sure. you know, the ecosystem is, is a place where entrepreneurs work on solving customer needs. And, and that's what Grab did. And Grab could never have been created in Singapore because Uber was there. Singapore is very much in terms of its needs for its consumers, its taxi drivers, its, its, its technology challenges, very much like the rest of the world. You know, and it's a perfect terrain for Uber. But the Grab founders started saying, okay, it doesn't work in Southeast Asia, right? Uber is not going to ask the drivers to come and deposit cash in their bank account like the Grab founders did. They could not have even thought of that in Singapore because that's not a problem they had, right? Oh. And not surprisingly, Grab developed into a payment system, right? Also, because that's what they solved. The big challenge was payment. And that then gave this rise to fintech and payments and marketplaces and sharing economy in, in Malaysia. And the fact that Grab left that doesn't, that's not a problem for us, right? At Startup Genome, you know, we're created by entrepreneurs, you know, doing the biggest research in the world on startup ecosystems, becoming a tech company, selling to Sage, and then saying, we need to use our knowledge to help governments help us entrepreneurs. And it's about, can we have the ingredients in an ecosystem to create global category leaders? If they go on the stock market in London and the UK, you know, later, we can't control that. But what we see is the more we create winners in each ecosystem, the more of them stay. Right? The later they sell, the more they go IPO. And this is what's happening in Malaysia, right? Grab left fairly early, but really with Malaysian talent and entrepreneurial talent. And now we're seeing that more and more those, they prepare the terrain to show we can do it big in Malaysia. And now the, the current, the new winners, the new generation is, is staying a lot longer in Malaysia and, and, and building bigger companies and taking over foreign markets. And that's beautiful. And that's what we want. And do you think that's because the ecosystem here in Malaysia has evolved and a lot, lot more mature now that's able to hold back uh, and, and grow from Malaysia? Yeah. And, you know, it, it's, it's funny because when we started looking at this, we, we feel like all of the ecosystem is a little bit different and everybody say, we're different, right? Our culture is different. But when we look at the data, ecosystem follow a very um, st stable path across their growth. And that's why we can we could make those predictions, right? And that's why policies and programs lead to success when you copy and adapt to your local culture, but still bring, you know, a VC and a fund of fund, bring the scale up programs. And that's why it works everywhere because you know, entrepreneurs is a global culture. And, yeah. you know, the first time I realized that is when a group of Malaysian founders came to visit me in my office, Startup Compass, we're called at that time, formerly known as Startup Genome, and we got our name back. But one of the leaders of Grab was in my conference room. And uh, that was in 2014, I believe. And, um, and I got out of that discussion saying these Malaysian entrepreneurs could be living in San Francisco. They could have been there for 10 years and they would speak exactly the same language because they speak the same language as entrepreneurs in San, in San Francisco. And that's when I saw the light. I'm like, we are developing a global startup ecosystem culture. Wow.
Yeah. Good. Thanks. And you brought one point. I just want to, before you share with us uh, uh, about the ecosystem here, uh, you brought up one more point that uh, actually predicted that the the time it takes for companies to raise money from one series to another is going to be shorter and shorter and shorter because the ecosystem is getting mature. And we saw that. We saw that this year. We've seen fintech companies that are raising Series A at 20 million US. We are seeing Series C, uh, like Series D, we see a spec as well uh, coming through uh, from Malaysia into the US. Uh, so, so yeah, so definitely seeing that money is beginning to come in, and um, and and we want to hear that from you as well as you present uh, how the ecosystem is evolving here in KL or or, or Malaysia. Um, um, what what else must we do? So maybe Jay, yeah. if you want to show, so go ahead. Maybe let's share some some slides. Maybe it's a good time, and then then we can yeah, get please, to that. Ahead. Yeah. Give us some good news. So, you know, like last year, you and I was talking, we're talking about, right, the leaders of MDEC and the governments in Malaysia saying, we need to make Malaysia top 30 by 2025 and a stretch goal. But, you know, I think when I look at the global growth versus Malaysia, I mean, you'll see how impressive it is. So let's just go through the numbers. But the global startup ecosystem value is now 3.8 trillion dollars. Wow. And in, in 2017, I think it was 1.8, you know, grows wow. so fast. Last year, because of COVID acceleration, 20% growth, uh, which is really, really quick, is 2x faster than what wow. we've seen before. Between 2019 and 2017 was 10% a year, 21% in two years. So you saw it accelerated. Our, our economy are transitioning to the digital economy in an accelerated pace. And tech entrepreneurs, tech companies are really benefiting from it. Fantastic. When we look at the 100 emerging ecosystems, though, 55% growth. So I removed the top 40 and I take the 100 after. And, you know, that begs the question. As an entrepreneur, where do you want to be? Want to be in the U.S., in China, or you want to be in those emerging markets, right? You want to be in the emerging markets where it's growing faster. And, you know, I was reflecting just before the session of when I was graduating from college and Japan was the place to be. And then when I graduated from Harvard Business School, China was the place to be. And now China is slowing down. And where do you want to be? I right? want to be, I think Southeast Asia is one of the markets that are growing the fastest. We talk a lot about Africa, South America, but it's very early stage, except maybe for, for Brazil and Chile. So Southeast Asia is a great place where the markets are growing even faster than the average. And so this is really globalization of tech and we say democratization of tech, but sometimes I hesitate to use that word because of the word democracy in there. But, you know, 91 cities with a unicorn now. And, you know, uh, Arno Morelix was reflecting two years ago saying, it's like the four minute mile. We thought never, nobody would run the four minute mile. One person did and within a few years, dozens had done it. And within 10 years, hundreds had done it. And the 4 billion mark and the unicorn mark in tech has been the same thing. 91 cities from only 30 in 2017 when Ario was writing that. And now we're welcoming, as you said, Malaysia's Carsom, right? Following on Grab's trailblazing. And so, but let's look at the number for Malaysia. Record Series A growth, 44% growth in number, 143% in sum of value of all Series A. The average round size grew 1.7 times to 4.5 million US. And that was one of the issue you and I were talking about last year. The rounds yeah. were too small to allow you to take to go penetrate Indonesia very early and the other Southeast Asian market, let alone taking over the world, right? Yeah. I'm going to look at Series B, 50% growth in number, 400% growth in total value, in total funding, 3.4x growth in the average round. And, you know, of course, there's there's a lot of inflation in the funding market, right? COVID has created that because the stock market has been booming. And when the stock market booms, there's money flowing in public and private market, right? But that's a problem for investors. For entrepreneurs, this is great. That yeah. means that for each time you raise money, uh -huh. you get twice as large a check for the same dilution of your stock. And that's just so that great. Means the, that means the ecosystem is now saying that your valuation here is now a lot higher than it was. The same business, the same value, uh, the same business valuation is now a lot higher this year. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, it's because it's just a ratio, right? For, for a, a VC at Series A, they want 25 to 30% of the market yeah. and they compete with the check size. And the more they compete, the more they increase their sex, check size. And if you get 5 million for 25%, your valuation is you know, 20 million. But if you get 10 million for 25%, your valuation is 40 million. Yeah. And all that means is that, that an entrepreneur can raise more money with, for the same 25% I give to an investor. But that means I can go a lot further because inflation on the cost of labor has not gone, has not doubled, right? Which is, means you, I can accelerate and I can get out of my national market much faster. And this is really positive for Malaysia. And, you know, I, I'm really happy this is happening. This happened last year for Malaysia because you were at a level of maturity where your ecosystem could take advantage of it. So oh, that right. happened in 2017. Probably we would not have seen that explosion in the in the funding numbers. Valuation, three times more startups with a hundred million dollar valuation. Now we're talking about success, right? Hundred million is, a, is already a su successful tech company, and exits 133 percent more, and that means 2.3 times more, you know, in exit value. Uh, so amazing, right? So 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 just just on the exits, we could go back to the slide on the exit, and and this is not for me, but I, I'd like the audience to know. Why are exits important in an ecosystem, please? Well, I mean, a good course, number to see. You know, exits is about a stamp of success, right? I sold the company to another organization and they valued it. And I get money to be able to pay my investors, return cash back into their coffers so they can reinvest. I give them returns so that they can raise bigger funds next time. And then I also shared a lot of resources back into the ecosystem. People who are VPs and are smart engineers who say, okay, now it's time for me. Now I'm, I made a, a million, a half a million dollars, even 200K with that startup, with my stock. I'm gonna start my own company, right? Or I'm gonna become an angel investor, right? And, with, and the big ones, the, the founders or VPs maybe say, I'm gonna invest as an LP in a VC and then I'm gonna help scale another company. So it, it sheds a lot of that scaling skills and that that, that, that financial assets back into the ecosystem. Of course, you know, one of the first questions I had from a deputy minister in 2015 <laughs> in Toronto was by Giles Gerson, deputy minister. And he said, what about leakages, JF, leakages? And I said, you know, you can't control that. Don't try to control that. The more Toronto is gonna produce exits, the more they will stay because the more there's gonna be scaling skills in Toronto. And look at ways. They, yeah, they moved to Palo Alto, but really they moved 10 people to Palo Alto. And there were 90 people in Tel Aviv and they sold at 1.7 billion. That would have never happened if they stayed in Tel Aviv. And oh. now maybe 40, 50% of that value went back to the investors and the 90 employees in Tel Aviv and that explodes the ecosystem, right? So, so that model don't... becomes fashionable. That model becomes fashionable. Everybody using that model. So obviously you want to do IPOs, companies yeah. that last and stay. And that rate of IPOs and that rate of the company sold, sells, but the executive, the employees stay in the, in the country raises as your, the size of your excess increases. So you're on the path, right? It's going to solve itself naturally. And it solves itself in every ecosystem. Interesting. But you cannot be impatient with leakages, you know. So Toronto was top 10 emerging ecosystem last year. I can't announce where it is this year because we're launching the report on September 24th, 24th. I mean, oh, 24th. In, in London Tech Week. Uh, but, you know, these numbers, I can tell you, are improving. And, you know, you as I said before, you're one of the fastest growing startup ecosystem. And, you know, what, what you're working on is building that, that top part of the pyramid, the scale-ups. And, and you're, you're doing incredible in doing that. And it's about policy, it's about programs. I think we're gonna have the chance to talk about this, uh, but you know, developing a culture of regional and global market reach and building global mentors, business networks, VCs that can write bigger checks. And you can see this year already, you're well on the way to solving some of those issues. And the third one was about more innovative and deep tech startups. And I think we're gonna talk about that too, but you know, what I see happening in drones where you have four global companies in a, in a very deep tech uh, subsector is telling me that, you know, you have, you have this deep tech talent. And, you know, there's the, the fact that Singapore has been there 
hiring your technical and your growth talent and forming them in scaling means that those those employees can return to Malaysia and then start their own company or help scale the companies of other entrepreneurs. And that's really benefiting you, the growth of Singapore. Um, and also the fact that Singapore is a very different market. So those solutions like Grab developed for Southeast Asia cannot be developed by Singapore entrepreneurs. I think that's it. Very good. So, so where do you think we went right and where do you think we're going wrong, Jeff, as, a, as an ecosystem here? What, else, what, what, have we, what do you think we've been doing right to, to, to see this explosion? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's funny because being from Silicon Valley, I thought governments leave us alone and it's great. Because in Silicon Valley, we have everything we need. Right? We already have VCs and VCs that were formed 40 years ago. We already have all kinds of programs. We have already have scaling skills. We already have a bu global business network because every, so many companies developed it for us. So when uh, Accenture and Nesta in the UK called me and said, what do you think is the power of policy? I said, I don't know, 3%, 5%, very little. But you know, after I started working with leaders like you, and seeing the impact of policy, then I know this is what explains growth. And Magic, MDEC now really taking leadership and program like GAINS where you help this solve the problem that, that you had a few years ago and you're still working on it, but making great progress and with gain and taking and helping entrepreneurs develop a channel in other countries in Indonesia and around the region and helping them developing, increasing their sales pipelines and understanding the other corporate market, market needs in B2B especially, and then also in B2C, this is the right path. And corporate partnerships that helps your B2B startups have relationships and collisions with executives that can tell them what are the problems, are, what problems are worth solving for them. Because you get out of university, you don't know that. And so this is the relationships that a program and a, a government can help forge so that the entrepreneurs can piggyback on the network and not have to all individually build our own network, but because that takes years. What else do you think we should be doing? I mean, we, we're scaling up whatever we are doing. Uh, what's working, we're scaling. Uh, what else do you think we should do to improve the, uh, or remove some of the silos that we have? Well, you know, I, I think the next step for you is now you're, you're creating regional leaders, and you've done so in the past and you're, you're, we see it happening more and you're starting to create global leaders, but in, 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 in certain verticals or subsectors, the next step is really, is really that, is to give you a global business network, global scaling skills inside Malaysia. And that's, that's, a, that's a tough nut to crack. And, you know, even Singapore is just starting to really be able to create global market leaders, global category leaders, really truly low, global, not trying to do regional leaders. And I, I think that was helped a lot by COVID. So this is one aspect, right? Where you need, you need to have programs that help you. Programs that are rooted outside, that have mentors outside that can play business network outside and all, all kind of uh, trade programs and sales mission programs, but also mentorship programs that helps you form not entrepreneurs at that level, but executives, right? It's about professional executives. When you get to five, 10, 20 million in revenues, it's not the entrepreneurs that are leading. The entrepreneurs might be a professional CEO, might become a professional CEO, professional CTO, but your COO, your CMO, your CS, chief sales officer, all need to learn from somebody, somebody has done it before. Because that, when you start growing really fast and you've never done it before, by definition, you have very scarce resources inside. Mm -hmm. And so unless you have someone who's done it before to help you, this is very difficult. So if you think of a niche that uh, the KL ecosystem can play, if there's a niche and um, in, in, your own, uh, uh, in, in your own research and the data points that you have, where's that niche in terms of technology? Where do you think uh, you see Malaysia uh, having that niche? Well, so, you know, you've already have a couple of, you know, top expertise in a, I think last year, maybe we talked about two, I think there's, there's a third and a fourth emerging, but mm -hmm. you know, of course in FinTech, which when financial markets are hot like they are, and you know, for several years we've been payment, we've seen payments being super hot, 
with tech startups becoming scale ups and IPOs in that domain a lot. But you know, lots of competition for Western markets. And one one thing that you have that nobody else has that much is you know at that at that stage of the ecosystem development is the Islamic fintech market, right? Mm -hmm. Where there's a lot of unserved people in you know basic banking services and payment services, but also an enormous amount of capital. Uh, so that plays to your strength because when we look at your ecosystem versus, you know, other Islamic ecosystems like even Dubai, Riyadh, that's making great progress but still fairly small, unable to create uh, big global leaders. So that's that's your game to play, right? With your Sharia compliance clients certification mm -hmm. and attracting those fintech startups also that are looking to penetrate that market and would like to come probably to Malaysia. So programs that not only help your entrepreneurs, but also attract others so that they put a point of sales and start you know, creating jobs and economic growth in Malaysia because of your channel to this market, to this important market that is largely untapped. So what I'm hearing is Islamic FinTech, uh, Islamic digital economy is a game to play for Malaysia to be a differentiator, the niche that we have, right? And uh, what do you think about the, that say gaming as well, right? Gaming. Yeah, I was just about to start with gaming. What do you think about gaming? Where do you see Malaysia? You have data points that your research team is picking up. Where do you see Malaysia and gaming? Well, you already have a lot of assets and you have several large game companies that have created a creative talent pool that, again, companies all over the world are competing for talent. The war for talent is at its height. When the markets heats up, then you turn to emerging markets. And so Malaysia is, is at the right place. You have a lot of experience, you have large companies, you have a great talent pool, and you need to continue to bet on your strength. Right? You're one of the leaders in, in the region and even in the world in, in gaming. Uh, so you wanna to continue to help them create and also attract global companies to create more, even more economic growth for yourself. But the other ones that I see is like, you know, I'm very impressed with drone and we thought, you know, in deep tech, maybe Malaysia was not going to be that great, but, you know, four, four global companies in, in, in drone that we've seen. And drone is really data and AI, right? It's really completely deep tech at its roots. Uh, so impressive work there. I remember when we did the research on Malaysia, we're seeing that in Malaysia was uh, 40th in the world in ed tech. You know, one of the top, if not the, the best in the region. And that was not very exciting to me a year and a half ago. But now, uh, COVID. every elementary school, every yeah. high school had to use education technologies to continue to, to, to operate. Now, EdTech is hot. Right? Advanced manufacturing, a lot less hot because it was very hard to sell, do proof, proof of concepts in a plant during COVID and that was a very hot market and EdTech the opposite, right? Super hot. And that's one, one place that we don't talk a, a lot about usually, but where you have a lot of assets, great companies that are developing. And again, also solutions that are catering to the emerging markets as opposed to the US or Europe. Uh, so that means your competitors are in earlier stage than you mm. and you have a chance to, to have you know, sophisticated solutions for uh, those markets that that cannot afford and, and where the US and Europe uh, technologies don't fit. So one of the successes, uh, you spoke about EdTech, I take that note. Uh, the, one of the successes on, over uh, like in drone was that Malaysia collectively, all our all the agencies, we, we came together as a ecosystem developer. So we yeah. developed the ecosystem for drone. Do you think that was probably one of the reasons why you see drone tech taking off in Malaysia because four global companies now, one maybe the second biggest or even the largest in the world by this year? Yeah, definitely. And you know, when you start programs and, and specialized programs to help a set of companies penetrate a market and together learning what are the customer needs, what, are the, what is the competition, what are the techniques, it accelerates. And that's why I always talk about subsectors focus. You mm -hmm. can't be good at everything in this day and age. 
right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll become in 10 to 20 years, but the faster way to accelerate the growth of a startup ecosystem and create success is bet on your strength and focus. The more focus you have, the better. Not only because the local ecosystem, the local connectivity, the sharing of knowledge about customer needs, techniques, employees, right? Developing a talent pool that specializes and understands those needs accelerates, but also because when you want to attract talent globally, you need to you need to have an identity. Nobody moves to Malaysia because it's a top 10 emerging ecosystem in the world, right? But someone who works in fintech, someone who's interested in fintech, someone who works in a bank and wants to enter a hot tech startups, when they see that you have a really uh, leading edge in Islamic fintech, now he's called, mm -hmm. she's called to come. And so identity and focus is very important. Thank you, very good, very, very good insights. Um, we, have, we have 14 minutes more. I'm gonna look at my question bank. And uh, I would like to leave the last five minutes to talk to you about your predictions for 2022 for Malaysia. But let me look at my question bank. I have a question for you. That's a tricky question. Jeff, you are a serial entrepreneur and you and, and you are a you're a serial entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. Where would you, if you have to start do another startup, where would you go? Singapore or Malaysia? Well, if I if I if I if I if I were yeah putting my health my my myself in your shoes because you know of course I have a family so I'm stuck in Silicon Valley right with my <laughs> friends and family I'm not moving but if I was to start again right I want to go in markets that are developing very quickly right and where I can create something unique that answer customer needs and emerging markets is where there's a lot of unmet demand mm -hmm. Singapore not the case right Singapore has B2B customers, corporations, consumers that are very much have similar needs as you know Silicon Valley with, with 14,000, 18,000 startups in Silicon Valley trying to solve these needs with lots of access to capital. So you wanna be close to the market as opposed to be close to, you know, the, 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 just the, the, some of the investor relationship resources or past exits, right? As an entrepreneur, you wanna be close to the market and you can solve emerging market needs from Silicon Valley, it's very hard, or from Singapore. And just like it's very difficult for, you know, Malaysian entrepreneurs to solve the needs of California consumers or corporations. So, you know, go where the growth is very fast, where there's chaos, where there's fast development. You know, in a, in a fast growing market, it's much easier to gain market share than in a stable market. The US market is growing two or 3% a year. China now is at what, 6%, 7, you know, much lower. That means more competition and lots, lots less fluidity. So you're saying Southeast Asia and within Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, you may pick Malaysia, KL. Yeah, I mean, like when you look at Southeast Asia, 3.5 trillion probably market in 2021. Super, super large. Six six hundred sixty million consumers, right? amazing, but also corporations, businesses that have that needs to be digitized. Mm -hmm. Whereas in San Francisco, in Europe, in China, not the case anymore. So you want to go where you bring your your skills, and they're special for the market, for the B two B market, or for the consumer market. This is where you're going to reap the most benefits. And when I look regionally, Malaysia because of its experience that a lot of his employees, a lot mm -hmm. of his entrepreneurs have gained in Singapore and scaling, you know, you have an ecosystem that has a lot of, of what you need to succeed. Good. So I've got another question for you, and then I've got a question for me. The second question for you is, why is Startup Genome benchmarking against cities rather than countries? What is the reason behind? Because we're entrepreneurs, we're, we realize that Innovation happens at the city level. But, you know, I also went to Harvard Business School. One of my professors happened to be Michael Porter. So he wrote Competitive Advantage of Nations and start talking about industry clusters at the city level. So Bjorn was less taken by Michael than I was, but he had already seen from experience that 
ecosystems are local, right? You hire people that are local. Investors, angels want to invest and be able to go have a coffee with you. And VCs also at Series A. And, you know, a lot of it is local. So therefore, you know, when I put, I brought, you know, started bringing the industry cluster model of Michael Porter into our research, it just, you know, everything was pointing to the fact that, you know, Canada might be good at innovation. US might be good on average, but Silicon Valley is incredible at it. New York is awesome. Dallas, Dallas, the fourth largest region economically in the US. Have you heard of unicorns in Dallas? No, right? So it's not the US, right? People talk about aversion to risk that in the US is lower. All the research shows it's not true. Aversion to risk is a lot lower in Silicon Valley, in New York, in Boston, and very high, just as high in Philadelphia and Dallas than it is, you know, maybe in Frankfurt and Stuttgart and Bordeaux. Ooh, I have one question for myself. Thank you, um, uh, Jeff. And I hope, I hope uh, the person who asked the question is clearer now. Um, I have one question for myself, but maybe you can also jump in. Uh, Malaysia Tech Entrepreneur Pass is a program that MDAC has launched. With all the good news said around the ecosystem, do you see this as a success? Let me answer that question first, and, and maybe I'll ask you as well to jump in. Let me answer the question first. So yeah, Malaysia Tech Entrepreneur Pro Program has been launched. It's been on for the last three, three over years. Uh, we've got more than 240 MTAP uh, pass holders, uh, out of which 130 have already set up their office here. And, uh, and we had a panel just a few days ago talking to uh, four different MTAP holders from, from four different countries. And uh, some of them have, uh, most of them have uh, employed uh, locals, co-founders and locals. And uh, some have even raised money. Yesterday we read one of the companies just raised US $6 million uh, uh, of funding. So, so MTAP is uh, successful. Unfortunately, the COVID has hampered a lot of travel. Uh, so we see a decline in the uh, run rate for the application. Uh, but once uh, the, the, the markets open up again, uh, um, we, we think that it will do well once again. Uh, so to answer your question, um, you didn't put the name, Yes, it's a part of our MDEX land and expand strategy, which is essentially going around the world to say, come, get your startup into Malaysia and, and, and grow from Malaysia into ASEAN and to the other parts of the world. Jeb, do you want to add on that if you want to? I think you answered it very well. And I think that, you know, when, when we look at the, the programs, the investment of, of the government, starting with MAGIC and now really MDEX taking a lot of leadership, uh, you know, we think this this is bode well, and this is a great place to to be supported. Uh, and your your I policies. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, well, I'll leave it there. <laughs> so, um, so, so, have you seen? Uh, so, I have one more question coming through, um, but it's not. It's been deleted. Can you? Okay, Jeff. Can you give us tips on how to become a unicorn? Well, don't focus on becoming a unicorn, right? Focus on creating a global category leader, which means focusing on customer needs, right? Don't focus on technology, focus on customer solutions, customer problems and solutions to their problem. And so you're maybe have technical skills and then use them to solve the customer problems, listen, you know, and then start, start being paranoid about whether your solution meets it the best in the market. Look at your competitors. Learn from all around, and then and then and then start hiring people who are better than you. If you're a technical person at, at growth, if you're a business person, then they want to do the opposite, of course. But creating a unicorn is about also, you know, ambidextrous skills, right? technical skills with business skills, and in every ecosystem that has only one, they don't grow as fast. So. How to become a unicorn is, is both great technical skills and great growth skills. Beginning technical skills. But the problem is not the technology. The problem is, you know, it's not about solving technological problems, it's about solving customer problems. So use your skills as Play-Doh to shape the solution and then bring in your team people who can sell it or better than you maybe at soft skills. 
And that's where that's how you create a unicorn, right? Creating a great solution and scaling it, selling it. But don't look at valuation. Don't look, look at what? At rev, look, don't look at valuation. Look at revenue. Look at the customer satisfaction. They're much more, much better predictor of whether you're going to become a unicorn. A unicorn is just a reflection of a company that really was good at solving customer needs better than everybody else around them and then ex executing on that. Actually, that's a good point because um, Southeast Asia, typically we come from a culture of very scared to fail. We, we fear failure. But what I've learned in the Silicon Valley is, uh, uh, Valley is failure is a badge of honor because you learn, you keep learning, you keep learning. And even if you don't make it, people still respect you. Valuations are there when you, when you start a business, even if you have failed 10 times. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that, Jeff? Because that's a culture change uh, for this part of the world. Yeah, here we, we're talking really about, you know, startup experience and scaling, scaling experience. And having done it before puts you, I mean, entrepreneurship is extremely difficult. It's scary. <laughs> and you learn a lot because you wear many hats. And at the beginning, you know, you think you want to go deeper, build a better product. And really as, a, as an entrepreneur, you want to have breath, not much depth. And you want to initiate, try things, experiment, be curious, right? Uh, and so once you've never done it, you're still probably too high on depth, not enough initiation, not enough okay. taking risk. The second time, the third time, we reward it in Silicon Valley because you're not going to same, make the same mistakes. And that's something that the culture change around you, the culture of investors and programs and everybody around you. And so as, a, as an entrepreneur, take risk, experiment. Uh, and I think the culture is changing in, in Malaysia to reward, you know, uh, what in Seoul, so the Korean government created a fund for second chance, only entrepreneurs who had failed before. <laughs> and that's an interesting way to, to, to change the culture. Say, no, we actually have a fund just for that because we know it's important. I've done it before. And when I measure talent, I don't measure the production of software engineers. I measure the, the, the access to engineers who've been in a startup before and have been there for at least two years because... In the large corporations, you're a database analyst, you do database analysis the whole day. Yeah. You're an engineer in a startup, you do everything. Yeah. You do absolutely everything. And even if you have your boss who's more experienced, it's still your boss is bringing you on every problem because I only have two or three people. Yes. They do everything. You learn completely differently and you learn a lot faster. Good. Thanks. Jeff, I have hardly two and a half minutes more. Um, your predictions last year, uh, we're good. I want to see if you could you get me to do another prediction. Yes. Can you predict twenty twenty the rest of twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two? What where do you see Malaysia? What do you see coming out of KL? And um, yeah, over to you, Jeff. I have a thousand. I have a thousand business uh, batting average. I'm going to be risk averse. <laughs> <laughs> No, but seriously, what do you see? Something substantial coming out from this ecosystem? Well, I, I, you know, when I look at these numbers of Series A is growing so fast, Series B growing so fast, you know, investors are not dumb, right? Maybe the, the set check size is increasing, but they still have rigor in terms of who do you invest in and who mm -hmm. are they going to. And so these success rates vary a little bit, but it spells to me that, you know, I predict two unicorns next year as opposed to, or this year as opposed to one, you know? And then twice as many exits. It's gonna keep growing because your, your, your funnel of success has doubled. And so therefore, that's what I predict for, for Kuala Lumpur. And Kuala Lumpur is gonna still grow for a while faster than, than your regions. This is normal, this is good because this is where you build all those scaling resources and those relationships with global markets and where the regions can draw upon those, those this talent and those skills and these relationships. Uh, but you know, I think what you're gonna see is regions specializing more and more and, and having therefore a, 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 a I wanna say a French word, <laughs> a call to action and a specialty uh, that, and that will emerge, but that's gonna be slow. But, you know, for Malaysia, I see, I see a lot of growth and I see mm -hmm. more success in deep tech as the world is increasing in deep tech. I was looking at funding and, and success and 
software without deep tech has been almost stable and the growth of of tech overall technology businesses has come almost 100% from deep tech so this is where you're going to see more and more success and this is where you should then invest more resources create more programs give them more support and more industry support how do i connect in your, your program of corporate partnerships where you have i think 75 partners now right last year you had yes uh, 100 you have 100, 100 now right this is where you 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 segment it and say okay we're trying to create solution for financial institution we're trying to create solution for act tech with those drones we're trying so that now you have programs where we have access to understanding customer needs and proof of concepts for your young entrepreneurs thank you very much jeff with that we've come to the end of the panel i want to thank you for spending your thursday evening with us here on a friday morning thank you jeff and i hope those predictions come through we'll see you again over back to you hasro Thank you, Gopi. Thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Gopi. Thank you, JF, for that wonderful discussion to start this Friday morning, or for you, JF, uh, Thursday evening. Can't wait for the London Tech Week announcement on September 22nd with that new list. Malaysia, together, let's push for digital in KL to move up the list every single year. Well, looks like we have some room in wrapping up Malaysia's tech ecosystem in Asia's startup arena, hopefully. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now be moving forward to our next session of the day, and it will begin very shortly. Do click join session and also complete a survey for us to help you and continuously serve you better. See you in a bit.